medical needs of incontinent patients as far back as 1988. And SFCS has been registered as a charity since 1991. We have been got, they have been conducting nursing, caregivers continence management courses, carnival symposiums, as well as congresses to advocate the management of incontinence. Since 2016, FSCS has been reaching out to advocate a change in diet and mindset to continue educating and updating themselves about this condition. They also encourage good communications between family members to facilitate healthcare professionals to manage the condition as a community. And today, you know, um, FSCS is here to moderate and let us welcome Ms. Felicia Chua, who will then introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Tricia Kuo. Over to you, Felicia. Thank you very much, Jenny. Hello to all the ladies here. Happy International Women's Day. I think it is such a wonderful time that we all come together to talk about something intimate. So before we even start anything, I think um, could all of you look into your Q&A um, icon and please put in your questions for tonight. It is such an honor that we managed to invite Dr. Trisha Kaur to come along to tell us more about um, weakness in bladder incontinence management. So it will really help yourselves and ourselves if you log in, uh, take a minute or so to log in your questions and as our panelists will uh, consolidate them. And throughout the entire uh, webinar, please feel free to also put in your questions into the Q&A section. So now Dr. Ko, she is actually um, a UK fellowship trained senior urologist currently with EuroHealth Medical Clinic. Now EuroHealth Medical Clinic is actually in conjunction working on very advanced technology as well with SGH to, to research on um, very new technology to cure stress incontinence. So this is these are things that um, we are very very grateful to have them here today to share with us their experiences, as well as you also have to know that Dr. Kuo, she sits on a many society and professional organization. So she was actually the um, executive committee member of Singapore Urology Association, Society for Continence. And she was one of the four founding um, um, important key personnel who set up the Sengkang Euro uh, department in Sengkang Hospital. Currently, she is also um, a visiting consultant to Kotekwat Hospital, Sengkang Hospital, um, SGH, and Thompson Medical. Her specialties are functional disorder and female urology, such as incontinence, ur urinary incontinence, and overactive bladder, reconstructive, and adolescent urology. So she, has, she is a very accredited um, surgeon um, doing, um, who is very well versed in um, laparoscopic uh, procedures in all these major hospitals. So we, it is such an honor to have her with us today. So welcome, Dr. Ko, and for the next few minutes, all the questions, please put them in the Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Ko. Felicia, you're making me very pious. Eh? <laughs> Thank you I, for, the, for the very, very nice introduction. <laughs> it has been a very great honor to have you as, as our board members. Oh, thank and you, thank you. And all the writings that you have done. Over to you and your time. Thank you very much. So um, as uh, introduced by Felicia, um, I'm a consultant neurologist and I'm currently working in uh, EuroHealth Medical Clinic, but I'm also a visiting consultant to various uh, departments uh, in all over the public hospitals in Singapore. Um, so happy International Women's Day, everyone. Um, and uh, it's an honor indeed to be able to talk to you about this topic today. Um, we're going to focus on bladder weakness, urinary incontinence, and bladder health in general. And as mentioned earlier, please feel free to ask questions. We'll try our best to answer uh, the questions at the end of the of this whole stack of slides. So um, before we go into the discussion, the slides itself, just a brief health disclaimer because uh, our lecture is uh, meant to uh, give you health information and it's more for general information and educational purposes only. Um, I just want to warn you that I do have uh, some material of a sensitive nature, um, mature teeth and topics and images as well. So this talk really is intended for an uh, older audience. And uh, if you have children at home, some viewer discretion is advised. So here's the outline for my slides. Uh, first of all, an introduction into urinary and bladder health. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on urinary incontinence uh, because that is the uh, condition that tends to affect the majority of people. Um, and then we'll summarize everything in some conclusion and take home messages. So what is the urinary system? Um, 
Well, it consists of the following uh, vital organs. Uh, it consists of uh, everybody has two kidneys. Um, the kidney is able to filter the waste products in our body. Um, and so it makes water and, uh, and filters uh, the waste products into and making that into urine. So um, that is uh, uh, done in the flesh of the kidney and then transported into the collecting system or the, um, the tubes in the middle of the kidney downwards um, into the ureter. And that is collected into the bladder. So our bladder is meant to hold our pee until its uh, bladder is full. Then we get signals sent from the bladder to the brain to let us know that the bladder is full and that we have to go and empty everything out. So all this is all complex and is coordinated very elegantly by our brain, spinal cord and nerves. So the bladder itself consists of uh, the following uh, essential uh, components. We have the bladder muscle, is, which is supposed to be able to stretch and to relax when it's supposed to store urine. And we also have bladder door muscles called the sphincter muscles. And these are supposed to uh, be able to uh, relax and contract um, accordingly, depending on what phase uh, the bladder cycle is in. So um, the bladder itself has two phases, very similar to what, what we would imagine breathing in and breathing out is like. So we have a breathing in or holding phase of the bladder where the bladder main muscle relaxes, is supposed to be able to store a significant, uh, a reasonable amount of urine. Usually our maximum bladder volume is about three to 400 cc. Uh, and then in this situation where we're keeping urine, the sphincter muscles or the door muscles are supposed to squeeze shut. So the opposite happens when we want to pee, the bladder muscle is supposed to squeeze or contract, uh, push the urine out and the bladder door muscles or sphincter muscles are supposed to be able to relax and open. So all this, as you can imagine, is rather complex. Part of it is uh, automated, meaning uh, it's controlled uh, by our automatic nerves. Uh, but of course, part of it is also uh, within our control. So we're able to squeeze the pelvic floor muscles uh, in, in a sense when we want to, uh, when we're feeling urgent and we can't reach a toilet in time. Um, so it's very similar, and I always like it to breathing in and breathing out. So bladder, bladder weakness, uh, strictly speaking, can refer to either uh, storage or a voiding problem. Um, and some people even have both. Um, however, we find that uh, when we come to research and uh, looking at studies, uh, bladder storage problems tend to be more common. So this generally presents in someone as ha having urinary leaks or urinary incontinence. And these two, two terms are interchangeable. Um, although it affects both men and women, uh, urinary leaks or incontinence, all these storage problems generally are more common in women and tend to affect older people as well. So uh, urinary incontinence is a storage problem. Uh, and urine, when we say a urine incontinence, we mean an unintentional loss of urine. And we tend to classify in terms of the different types of urinary incontinence. The two most common types are stress incontinence as well as urgency incontinence or what we call overactive bladder. Um, and the other less common subtypes includes overflow incontinence and total incontinence. Um, the, when we say mixed incontinence, we tend to mean that someone has a combination of urgency and stress incontinence, as you can see there on my slide. So for the purposes of uh, just general information, I want to focus, of course, on the two most common types of incontinence, stress, as well as uh, urgency or overactive bladder type of incontinence. Why do we bother to differentiate between these different types of incontinence? Well, uh, because all these different uh, issues are all treated very differently. We've got to treat the root cause. Uh, and as such, sometimes we can't differentiate what the exact subtype or the root cause is. Then in that case, uh, we need to do some basic tests uh, because uh, although someone may present with uh, certain urinary symptoms or discomfort, that doesn't always match up to the underlying condition or diagnosis. And therefore, uh, some, some basic uh, urine tests are typically required. And interestingly, sometimes uh, both the storage and uh, uh, voiding problems of a bladder can have present exactly the same way. Um, and with, with this kind of a typical setting, uh, a lot of uh, functional urologists like myself always use this quote that the bladder is an unreliable witness. So let's go straight into what stress incontinence is. Uh, it's not caused by mental stress or emotional stress. When we say stress, it means that if there's any downward pressure on the on the bladder itself, uh, such as with any exertion, and that results in a leakage of urine in someone. So leaks with exertion include activities such as coughing, sneezing, laughing, exercise, or even carrying heavy things. Why does this happen? Unfortunately, it's more common in ladies, and that's because 
of uh, pregnancy and uh, multiple childbirth. As you can see on the picture, number one, uh, whenever someone is uh, pregnant, the baby uh, is, is rather heavy and presses downwards on the bladder as well as the pelvic floor muscles, as you can see here. So turning over time, as someone nears uh, perimenopausal, uh, getting older kind of age group, those muscles can also stretch out and sag and weaken. And uh, because of that, um, we find that stress incontinence tends to occur uh, quite commonly near a perimenopausal age group. Uh, of course, any sort of risk factors that will result, result in increased abdominal pressure, such as a chronic cough, will also increase the risk of urine leakage in this type of situation. Uh, but men are not spared as well. Men can also get stress incontinence. Now, uh, you might find this surprising, but uh, men who've had particularly any sort of pelvic uh, type of intervention, particularly surgery for prostate problems, or even radiation for prostate problems, can get uh, urinary incontinence. So why does this happen to men? Um, so um, the, for a man, the anatomy is a little bit different compared to a lady. They have something special called a prostate. The women don't have prostate. Prostate is the gland that sits below the bladder itself. Uh, if you look at the diagram on the right, um, you can see that uh, this orange thing in, on the normal diagram, that's the prostate. If someone has prostate cancer, that prostate is removed uh, to remove the cancer. And uh, subsequently, there is a lack of support for the pelvic floor in a man as well, and therefore they can be more prone to uh, stress incontinence. Whereas someone who has uh, urgency incontinence or overactive bladder, it's a totally different situation. So the symptoms are such that uh, even before the bladder is full, uh, even like a half tank, for example, 100 mils, 200 mils, as opposed to a full 300 cc's, that person affected will have a sensation of very, very severe need to go and pass urine that they cannot ignore, and that's called uh, urgency, whereas the uh, urge to pass urine is a, is a normal thing. Urgency to pass urine is a abnormal sensation. So overactive bladder is characterized by this sensation called urgency. Some people, in, in some people, the urgency is so severe that even before they reach the toilet, the urine tends to leak out. So what are the causes for overactive bladder? A lot of times it's associated with nerve problems. So this tends to occur more commonly in people with uh, neurological problems such as a previous stroke or Parkinson's disease, and it's because of abnormal like, signals um, in the, the spinal cord and the brain. Um, but it can also occur uh, as part of an uh, aging and wear and tear process, uh, where sometimes the triggers for uh, the urgency sensation can be particularly interesting. Uh, I had a patient who told me that uh, the trigger for the urgency is just reaching the house and putting the key in the door. So the trigger for this uh, condition can be very different in uh, various people. So as I mentioned earlier, there can be age-related changes to the urinary system. Um, just as a joke, I put that as an age test. If you know the connection between the two objects, then um, you, you must be of a certain age. But anyway, um, the age changes is, is, uh, affects the whole entire urinary system. Uh, it doesn't just affect the bladder. Uh, it affects the kidneys, first and foremost. Kidneys tend to work less efficiently as we get older. We tend to lose more water. Um, the bladder itself, the storage capacity tends to decrease and the bladder muscle's ability to contract also lessens. So this tends to lead to a higher residual volume after uh, we have peed. And unfortunately, women tend to get menopausal symptoms as well. Um, because of the loss of the female hormone estrogen, it leads to a loss of collagen, elastin, urethra, the pee pipe, and leads out from the bladder to the outside of the body, may thin out, and that same thing happens to the vagina lining. And we may have an increased risk of urinary tract infections because it's easier for bacteria to go uh, uh, in from outside the body to inside uh, when the lining is thin. Sometimes the signs of bladder issues, such as incontinence, <coughs> I beg your pardon, are not so straightforward. So the signs are quite subtle. You may notice this in um, family and friends. Um, it includes uh, uh, trying to uh, sit uh, according uh, near the aisle seat where there is a uh, uh, closer access to the toilets. Uh, these people tend to avoid long trips. Um, if uh, the incontinence or the leakage is very severe, some people even bring extra clothes when going outdoors in case of uh, accidents. Uh, and they also tend to use pads. They, and they also tend to do this thing called toilet mapping, which is uh, before they leave the house and uh, um, in between the journey, or halfway through the journey, they've already planned that uh, they're going to stop off halfway, use the toilet, and then carry on for the rest of their journey. So it's called toilet mapping. Why is it important to seek help? Well, um, um, 
uh, particularly if bladder issues affect sleep uh, at night, it can lead to, uh, um, so it's not just the daytime at night as well, it can lead to distress, low mood, uh, loss of uh, sleep tiredness, decrease in normal daytime functioning. And uh, they also can affect the family members who are staying in the same household, not just the person with the bladder problem. So although these uh, bladder conditions in general are not dangerous, they can take a toll on uh, someone's emotional and mental health and well-being and can take particularly distressing because it can affect relationships, uh, social activities, and the people around us. Okay, so let's go into uh, the incontinence issue properly. So this is how a doctor tends to think. Uh, we generally approach urinary incontinence depending on the subtype, as I mentioned earlier. So we want to, of course, get a correct diagnosis before we embark on any treatment. So for a doctor, whenever we want to get a diagnosis, there always needs to be a, a gentle check of the tummy, uh, abdominal examination. We would also, if uh, the symptoms are suggestive uh, of urinary tract infection or UTI, we'll definitely do a simple basic urine test, such as urine that stick, uh, urine microscopy, or even a urine culture. So that is pretty standard. This is a little bit more special though. This is something called a bladder diary. And generally, um, a functional doctor, functional urologist will tend to do these uh, tests. Um, so why is this special diary so important? Uh, well, okay, so this is a typical recording of a bladder diary and it's done at home over a three day period. So there is a fluid taken uh, column and there is also a urine pass column. So that means the person doing this bladder diary has to measure the amount of urine that is uh, peed out uh, throughout the day. So this is a little bit tedious, yes, I know, but it's very, very helpful because it allows us to embark on uh, the first part of our treatment, which is uh, number one, getting the diagnosis. So if you can see the urine pass out column, uh, this patient that's affected uh, does not exceed 200 mils or so uh, in, uh, on a daily basis. That means the bladder has a small capacity. So it's leading towards our diagnosis of having urgency, incontinence, or overactive bladder. The other thing that's particularly helpful to note in this bladder diary, that if you look at the fluid taken column, uh, for example, on the third day, there is quite a lot of caffeine intake. So there's, uh, if you look there, there's tea, uh, cumin, tea, milk, coffee, coffee, tea, tea. So a large amount of fluid intake is essentially caffeine, which is not so good for the bladder because it's a diuretic and it will tend to uh, aggravate or irritate and uh, exacerbate this person's overactive bladder problem. So then lies the importance of having a bladder diary, which is extremely helpful. Extra tests are only done, especially if needed. So for example, if there's any red blood cells uh, or abnormalities on the urine, initial urine test, then we might organize uh, a scan such as an ultrasound, x-ray, or even a CT scan. So you can see uh, some x-rays on the left. If you look at the x-ray, there's this little round, round thing on the x-ray that is actually a bladder stone. So just a simple x-ray can pick up a very, very obvious thing sometimes, don't underestimate it. We also will tend to suggest uh, sometimes doing a telescope check, uh, particularly if uh, someone has a higher risk of uh, bladder tumors or cancers, uh, and especially indicated if someone is a smoker. Um, unfortunately, smoking increases the risk for not just lung cancers, but bladder cancers as well. The last test that we'll consider doing is called a urodynamic test. And uh, this is a, a test to look at the function of the bladder in a dynamic setting. So this is typically done if we're not sure of the diagnosis or we are thinking about uh, potentially in the future doing any surgery. So this is what a urodynamic test looks like. We fill the bladder up with uh, some contrast and we can do an x-ray. And usually when it comes to incontinence, we'll ask the, this person to cough, cough, cough. So if you see these red lines going up and down, that means this person is coughing, and then we're checking to see whether there's any leakage of urine. So that's how we get the diagnosis, and what treatments are available. Okay, so first of all, doesn't matter which category of incontinence, we tend to embark on conservative measures first. So it includes things with lifestyle changes, and as I mentioned earlier in the bladder diary, uh, that is uh, particularly helpful when I can see how much caffeine intake uh, someone has. Um, if uh, we can spot any other contributing factors to the urine leakage, then we can also advise accordingly. For example, uh, reducing uh, someone's weight, uh, watching the diet, avoid excessive uh, alcohol, which is also a diuretic, uh, maintaining good toilet habits, uh, and also um, uh, getting someone to stop smoking, particularly if they have a chronic cough. 
So this is a very frequent question I always get. In fact, someone uh, in my clinic just asked me the same thing today. Is yellow, having a yellow urine something that is normal? And said my answer was, yes, it is normal. So urine color can vary from being uh, transparent, translucent, to all the way to dark yellow. So um, uh, dark yellow means that sometimes uh, someone is dehydrated and really not drinking enough water. So we've got to aim to drink at least 1.5 to 2 litres of uh, fluids a day. Uh, it may not always necessarily be pure water. You can also drink other types of fluids, includes things like soup. However, if someone has an orange pee, then perhaps uh, this needs to be further checked out because it could uh, be due to a liver or bowel duct uh, condition and it's uh, um, nothing to do with the kidneys. So these are examples of bladder-friendly foods, as you can see here. Generally, water and juice is healthy. And these are the uh, things that tend to irritate the bladder. It includes uh, things like uh, artificial sweeteners, uh, sodas as well. Okay, good toilet, ha toilet habits. So you've got to know what is normal first. Uh, it is normal to pass the urine every three to four hours. Uh, sometimes thinking about it and worrying about it only increases the sensation of wanting to pass. Uh, a person who is caught up in this cycle of frequently emptying out the bladder uh, only means that uh, it's every time they go, it's a small amount and the bladder never really gets to fill properly. And so it becomes a vicious cycle of going just in case. Pelvic floor rehabilitation, and that means uh, uh, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, pelvic floor exercises, patient education, which is what we're doing now, and lastly, biofeedback. So what are pelvic floor muscles? Uh, these are special group of muscles that form the floor between uh, one's legs uh, for both male and female patients. It is located between the bone in the front and the spine in the back. And it contains uh, several layers of muscles. So if you look at the pictures and diagrams here, you can see that it supports all the essential organs. Uh, for the lady, it will be the bladder, the womb, and the rectum. For the men, it will be bladder, prostate, and rectum. So how do we find the pelvic floor muscles itself to enable us to do a good uh, pelvic floor exercise? Um, you should be able to feel the pelvic floor muscles if you try and stop the flow of urine when you go to the toilet. However, it is not recommended, and I stress not recommended, that you do these pelvic floor exercises when you're passing urine or passing motion. Um, so if you're doing the correct uh, contraction of the pelvic floor, uh, the muscle should be lifting upwards and uh, one should be able to breathe easily. The incorrect action, is a, a, a sort of a, like a, trying to kick and trying to like hold your breath and push downwards. That is the totally wrong action and it's the opposite of what we want to achieve. So as I, I always say when I give a public talk, these exercises are uh, difficult to teach in such a public setting uh, and usually has to be taught by a doctor, a nurse or a physiotherapist. Particularly in a private setting because sometimes we have to do an internal examination uh, to show and press on the pelvic floor muscles to show you which is the correct one to squeeze. So just be very careful when you check Dr. Google um, and you've come across some yoga or Pilates pictures, they may not particularly be uh, accurate in depicting uh, pelvic floor exercises. So if uh, we're unable to uh, get someone to squeeze the caress of muscles, that's when we use biofeedback. And this is a computer-based learning system that uh, connects uh, uh, the muscles up to some electrodes and can measure muscle activity and it's used to help someone train uh, their uh, pelvic floor muscles. Um, so as part of the conservative measures, uh, we can always consider uh, use of pads, tubes and clamps when it comes to urinary leakage problems. So these are some of the examples. So pads nowadays are quite interesting. They are divided into uh, male and female pads as well. Uh, last but not least, catheters. So uh, I apologize for the sensitive nature of this picture, but it's essential to show you how these catheters and tubes uh, work. So uh, don't worry, these are really the last resort when it comes to treatment of incontinence. Okay, so let now, let's now talk about uh, stress incontinence first, and, and then I will switch uh, to talk about uh, OAD, overactive bladder, <laughs> urgency incontinence as the last couple of slides. So ladies first, uh, stress incontinence tends to affect ladies most frequently. And as I mentioned earlier, it can affect men as well, particularly if they have previous prostate operation. Um, now the treatment for stress incontinence for ladies, uh, we do have good behavioral modification and lifestyle changes uh, techniques, as I mentioned earlier. And then subsequently, uh, there is a gap, unfortunately, in our treatment options. 
And thereafter, we have very good surgical uh, techniques. So uh, fortunately, there's no good medicine for this uh, particular condition. And the effectiveness and long-term results of most minimally invasive therapies are quite mixed. So let's talk about the very good surgical options first. Uh, and the gold standard nowadays is mid-eritual slings. So uh, this is a, a typical example of a mid-eritual sling. It's what we call a TVT or attention-free vaginal tape. Um, and there's a, a lot of very good research to show a very high cure rate, as you can see here. Uh, people tend to return to normal very quickly because it's day surgery and there's very few uh, post-op complications. So the placement of the tape, as you can see on the diagram here, is the red and the yellow one. It is placed around the bladder door itself. B is bladder. And uh, it holds the, the bladder door uh, uh, supportively such that uh, there's an increase of a, or uh, elimination of any, any urinary leakage uh, subsequently for stress incontinence. A variation of the TVT is called the TOT or the transobturator tape. So it's got a very similar concept as the TVT. It's, it's the only difference is that uh, the arms of the tape come out in a different, slightly different direction uh, through the thigh and the leg. So the advantage of this technique is that it's a lower risk of bladder injury uh, and also boiling difficulties. Uh, someone not being able to pee from the tape being pulled too tight. Now, fortunately, because of uh, it coming out through the tie or the groin, there is slightly higher risk of pain uh, after the surgery and vaginal injuries and also uh, erosion of the tape. That means the, the tape coming through um, uh, in, into the urinary uh, tract or the urinary system. You may have heard of this as well in the past. Corporal suspension used to be done, but it's less popular nowadays because uh, it used to have to be done through a larger incision and so the recovery time is longer. Uh, occasionally, this technique is still done uh, for people who have a concomitant, uh, that means like abdominal surgery that needs to be done at the same time, such as the removal of the womb. Um, they find that uh, this technique is associated with higher risk of uh, people having uh, voiding difficulties, that means being unable to pee after the surgery and also uh, having a pelvic organ prolapse after the surgery as well, so it is less popular. So I don't know if you've heard, uh, not so long ago, maybe about uh, three, five years ago, um, there's a lot of medical legal issues associated with using uh, synthetic materials such as mesh for uh, treatment of incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. Um, and this controversy is because uh, generally in the Angmore countries such as UK, US and Australia, a lot of the ladies who have had the mesh put in for prolapse surgery uh, subsequently had a lot of uh, post-operative wound pain. Um, but we don't see the same scenario in those ladies who were treated with uh, uh, the same uh, synthetic slings for stress incontinence. So we can rest assured that mesh, the use of mesh is still very safe when it comes to incontinence. And uh, there's this uh, quite a lot of uh, consensus statements from all these international societies uh, that are chaired by uh, good surgeons and doctors that show that the use of synthetic slings are still good, safe and efficient and have a uh, very low risk and side effect profile. So we've got to different shape between the two different types of surgeries. Mesh is still safe for stress incontinence. Uh, but however, because of all these going on overseas, um, there's a lot of alternatives now available and these are all the non-mesh options for stress incontinence. And I'll go through uh, some of them. And uh, there's not everything is available in Singapore, obviously. Uh, but uh, what we have in Singapore uh, is uh, fairly interesting to talk about. So I think I'll, I'll show you a few slides on that. So uh, one alternative, instead of using a synthetic uh, uh, mesh, we can always use our own body's uh, muscle. So we can uh, obtain a strip of muscle from the tummy wall, as you can see on the diagram on the left, and use that to uh, re re replace the synthetic sling. And it works the same way, we place it around the bladder door itself to pull the bladder upwards so that there's better support uh, for the bladder door itself and there is less leakage. We also have things like injectables. So uh, these are what we call bulking agents. Uh, um, um, although it sounds very nice to bulk up the bladder uh, door itself um, to reduce the amount of leakage. Unfortunately, the outcome and the success rate is not that great. 50 to 70 percent uh, and repeated injections are typically needed because the efficacy and efficiency tends to diminish over time. So this technique is uh, reserved for those who are higher risk for surgery and elderly. 
and those who are previously failed procedures and uh, any patient who shows a preference for this uh, particular technique. There are also vaginal inserts and pessaries. So although they uh, sound very nice, uh, you can see that uh, it, the packaging looks nice, but uh, if you look closely uh, underneath the packaging, uh, all these uh, devices tend to look a little bit uncomfortable, spiky looking, uh, and I, I think um, it essentially works like a stopper. Um, either you place a stopper in the vagina, or you place a stopper into the urethra to temporarily block the passage of urine. Lasers, lasers always sound very nice um, uh, because the rationale behind it is quite sound, to be fair. Uh, we model the collagen, uh, strengthen the muscles, and then uh, and all, the, all the essential supports of the vagina and the bladder neck. Uh, but however, the um, research for this is mainly to treat uh, any uh, genital urinary um, issues uh, due to menopause. Uh, rather, the research uh, for the use of lasers with incontinence is rather limited because it's uh, generally a small group of patients and their follow-up period is only about 6 to 12 months. So they tend to have a mix of objective success in research. And um, the yes, there is subjective improvement in the, the symptom scores, that means less leakage, but only for patients generally with mild incontinence. So that's how the laser works. There's a probe that enters the vagina, as you can see here. So although there is minimal reported side effects in the short term, um, the conclusion uh, is that there is insufficient evidence at the moment regarding long-term efficacy and safety. And as such, uh, uh, we're unable to have any firm conclusions or recommendations at this point in time. There are also uh, other technologies that are available. There's this uh, special chair, uh, which uses high-intensity focus electromagnetic field uh, to stimulate the, uh, the uh, pelvic floor muscles. Uh, it's particularly appealing because all the person treated has to do is to sit down on the chair and then you feel a gentle knocking. Um, but however, unfortunately, the research there is also rather weak. Um, the data is rather weak. So same as for lasers, there's no recommendation or consensus statement from international professional bodies with regards to this particular treatment. And there needs to be more um, uh, robust data uh, that hopefully will come out in the near future as well. Okay, so that's about ladies. Uh, men next. Uh, men can also be treated with uh, slings, uh, and I'll show you a couple of pictures in the next uh, slides. So in the context of someone who has previous prostate operation or prostate surgery, usually we we'll wait six to six months to one year uh, to make sure that uh, there's no recurrence of the prostate cancer, and we can achieve that either during uh, with a blood test or uh, with uh, scans. So these are the pictures that show a male sling. So Similar for ladies, the sling is placed under the bladder door. Um, there are two such slings available in Singapore, uh, advanced as well as the virtual sling. Uh, both of them have very good outcomes. How does the male sling work? So as you can see the diagram on the left, uh, when we pull up a sling, uh, similarly for a female patient, we add a lot of more uh, support to the bladder door area, the bladder muscles, uh, bladder door muscle and reinforce the strength of the muscle there. So I've got a nice video to show you what happens when we pull the sling during the surgery. So when we pull the sling, you can see uh, in the telescopic view of the pee pipe that there is a better um, a closure of the pee pipe, the urethra. And so there is a much better support. So the leakage will be less for a person that's affected with stress incontinence. So that, that's the same rationale for a female patient as well. Particularly for male patients, there is a special device that can be used if their leakage is very, very severe. So uh, if they use a, a lot of uh, uh, pads every day, or if they have very severe leakage uh, at night, then they use this thing called artificial urinary sphincter. So this is a special hydraulic device that consists of a cuff that goes around the pee pipe, as you can see here, very much like how we use a, a blood pressure cuff to measure uh, blood pressure. If someone wants to pee, they have to press the pump, and then uh, a movement of water allows the opening uh, of the pee pipe. So I'll show you how this works in a, this uh, diagram here. So number one, the calf contains water, it squeezes the urethra close. If a uh, person who has this device wants to pee, they have to press the pump that's sitting in the scrotum. That moves the fluid that's sitting in the calf here backwards into the balloon. Um, and then uh, the pee pipe is then open and that person can pee. And then how it works to 
maintain uh, continence or dryness is that the water will then slowly flow backwards from the balloon into the pump and then back into the cuff uh, to allow uh, closure of the urethra. So just to show you how it works, this is a closed urethra. When someone wants to pee, you press the, the pump and then the water uh, moves out of the cuff, allows the opening of the pee pipe and then the patient is able to pee. So it's going to slowly, slowly close so that there's enough time for this person to pee. This is, so this is how an artificial urine sphincter works. This is a telescopic view of the pee pipe. So it's quite interesting to look at this. I'm just going to speed things along because it takes a little while. Uh, in fact, for the calf to fill up water again and to squeeze the pee pipe or the urethra close. So you can see I'm moving it along. Slowly, slowly, you're going to get closure. So by now, hopefully, this person has finished passing the ring. And then after a while, it thinks the hole gets smaller and smaller. And this person is going to be eventually, the hole is closed. And then uh, this person can walk around and do uh, whatever he usually needs to do on a daily basis, go to work, maintain his normal social activities and remain dry. So this is the artificial urinary sphincter usually uh, put in for male patients, uh, particularly after uh, surgery or radiation for prostate cancer. Okay, so that's stress incontinence. Um, we're now going to talk about a little bit of uh, overactive bladder or urgency incontinence, and this is going to be the last part of the talk, really. So overactive bladder can affect both men and women, and you'll be happy to know that it's fairly simple. Both men and women get a, essentially the same type of uh, treatment. So usually we start with... Uh, behavioral modification, like uh, what I mentioned earlier, cutting down caffeine, alcohol. Then after, if it doesn't work, we'll start medications. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then we move on to minimally invasive options. So medications for overactive bladder or urgency incontinence, there's many, many types. Um, and the, uh, the older medicines tend to have a higher likelihood of side effects. And so most doctors nowadays tend to use the newer medicines, which are uh, safe, effective. Uh, such as uh, Mirabegron and Bamiga or Vesicare. Uh, these are uh, fortunately only needs to be taken once a day. However, of course, uh, we have to consider things like cost price and affordability, particularly if someone has to take these medications in the long term. So if the medications doesn't work, then we go into minimally invasive options. So it, we tend to divide it into two broad categories, either Botox injection for the bladder or uh, nerve stimulation. So uh, Botox, we typically we think of the aesthetics use of uh, Botox, uh, but it can also be injected into the bladder, as you can see here, using a telescope method, very fast. The whole thing only takes five to 10 minutes and is 70 to 80% effective. So this is uh, what uh, pictures of the injection look like. Of course, that is not so interesting, so I decided to show you a video. So that's what uh, the needle that is used to inject the Botox looks like. So we have two different types of uh, telescope and the telescope can bend in different directions. So the needle actually, as you can see here, is very, very small. And that's why we can do this uh, injection under uh, local anesthesia and some uh, sedation. So that's the needle and that's the normal appearance of the bladder. It's always pink in color. And then when the medicine goes in, there's a little bit of a, a collection of medicine under the lining of the bladder, as you can see. So this is uh, very well tolerated by most people. So we can see the needle gently going there and the introduction of the medicine uh, into the, and just underneath the lining of the bladder itself. And uh, as long as you avoid the major blood vessels, there's minimal risk. So we can tell that there's minimal bleeding. Um, and with the anesthesia, there is minimal pain and discomfort as well. So that's how uh, medicine is injected into the bladder. Um, unfortunately, uh, of course, uh, as with any Botox party, it only lasts every six months. So the treatment has to be repeated. Uh, minimal risk uh, because we always test the urine before we proceed, make sure there's, there's no urine infection. Um, the risk of retention generally is uh, about 10 to 20%. Um, and if there is someone that has a retention, then unfortunately, we'll need to learn how to self-catheterize. Nerve stimulation, there's two types uh, for overactive bladder. is either sacral neuromodulation or PTNS. 
So PTNS is particularly interesting because uh, it's derived from acupuncture techniques and uh, it's been around for many, many years. Uh, of course, Western medicine thinks of uh, it in a different way. We stimulate the posterior tibial nerve that goes all the way up to the spine uh, that is, uh, and is linked to the bladder. Whereas in terms of TCM um, uh, um, ideology, they are talking about energy substrates and pathways instead. So the ideology is slightly different, but interestingly enough, the needle is put uh, in a rather similar position on the leg, as you can see here. So it's put on the inner part of the ankle, uh, just above the bone. And uh, each uh, session is uh, about 30 minutes where a small acupuncture needle is placed and, and is stimulated. the nerve is stimulated by a low energy current. Um, this takes place once a week for up to 12 weeks. And generally, someone has tried at least uh, six to eight weeks before they see any improvement. Uh, but the lovely thing about this technique is that uh, it's got minimal risk of bleeding and, and a little bit of tiny pain when placing the needle, but that's about it. Whereas the uh, sacral neural modulation uh, is a lot more different. In fact, I just uh, uh, did uh, this uh, surgery for a patient this afternoon, uh, sacral neural modulation. Um, we place the wire directly into the nerve that supplies the bladder, as you can see on the diagram on the right. So uh, that uh, allows us to stimulate the, the sacral nerve root tree, which goes directly to the bladder. Then we connect that up to a, a, um, a battery device, uh, and it's similar to a, a, like having a pacemaker for the bladder. So this is an implantable, programmable neural stimulation uh, system for people with very severe uh, overactive bladder symptoms. Nice thing about uh, electrical stimulation is that there's no risk of urine retention, no scopes are needed, and there's no need for repeated injections. However, of course, depending on which particular technique, um, there's more frequent trips to see the doctors and nurses. And uh, of course, there's uh, more cost upfront uh, because of needles and the implant. So in summary, uh, this is how uh, a doctor generally approaches uh, bladder health and urinary incontinence. Um, we try to get the correct diagnosis first, uh, filling which we may need to do some basic tests. We try conservative measures first, and then we treat the uh, underlying incontinence according to which category uh, is uh, most predominant. So general health, well-being, and having a good quality of life is important to achieving happiness. Uh, bladder problems can be extremely distressing, affects the uh, one's daily function, uh, hence it's important to seek treatment. And um, the treatment to bladder uh, wellness and urinary incontinence does vary accordingly to the underlying cause, and help is not available for those suffering from uh, bladder issues and urinary incontinence. So thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you have. Thank you, Dr. Kuo. This has been so knowledge, I mean, so, so um, <laughs> formative, sorry. Well, we have quite a few questions. Uh, I think one of the most easiest one, which is very common is, does actually cranberry juice help with incontinence and UTI? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Actually, um, we the evidence or the, the research that goes into whether cranberry juice actually works is a bit uh, mixed. So uh, although some studies do show that it works, on the other hand, you do have an equal amount of studies that show that it doesn't. Um, but having said that, <laughs> um, cranberry juice and supplements like probiotics really have minimal risk. Um, you can treat them like health supplements, uh, in fact, to boost your immune system. So really, as long as you don't have any side effects from the cranberry juice and the other supplements that I mentioned, it's perfectly safe to try them because really, what do we have to lose? Um, if it does help, then that's great. If it doesn't, then, uh, you know, at least there's no major side effects. Can thank you. So another one that um, I'm just trying to place myself uh, as, as a lady. So, you know, sometimes like um, whether we are pregnant or sometimes it's accident, like, you know, we sleep and then we wet the bed or when we walk, when we have slow jog, it leaks or when, mm. we, when we have baby and then it sneezes, but it comes and go. So mm. what is the definition of incontinence? That's the first question. The second question is, will it actually come and go away by itself? Mm. Yeah, so any involuntary or inadvertent leakage of urine is called incontinence. Um, and yes, it is possible that it can come and go. So exactly like what you mentioned, uh, when a lady is pregnant, when the baby is there, you know, that's a lot of weight on the pelvic floor and on the bladder itself. So if you recall, recall my diagram, 
um, the um, pregnant women do very commonly suffer from incontinence or leakage. Uh, but fortunately, a lot of it is uh, transient or temporary. And uh, that's why most gynees tend to advocate doing the Kegel exercise or the pelvic floor exercise um, uh, towards uh, the third trimester, and even after the delivery of the baby, so that uh, we can get you back to a pre-pregnancy condition where your pelvic floor is a lot stronger, very much like going to the gym to train your muscles. Um, after doing the pelvic floor exercises for a while, hopefully uh, you get your pre-pregnancy uh, um, uh, strength back. Of course, this takes a lot of commitment and time Similarly, like going to the gym, um, you have to do the pelvic floor muscles. You have to be quiet and do the pelvic floor muscles every day for up to a month to six weeks uh, before uh, you generally see any improvement. So a month to six weeks, we should generally see an improvement. Mm. And that, right, can we also say that um, if, let's say, like the, the, the incontinence come and go, do we mm. really have to seek help? or which is the point that we actually go to the doctor? Because this leads to the next question, which is um, what is considered mild incontinence and beyond, um, beyond that, like when do we actually mm. need to see a doctor? Mm. Yeah, I think it's quite clear that if this incontinence affects your lifestyle, then uh, it's, a, it's a definite uh, yes that you need to see a doctor. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not always easy to learn how to do a Kegel exercise or a pelvic floor exercise actually. So if you find that after trying for a short while and you don't seem to see any improvement, then it's worthwhile getting some help from a healthcare professional, be it a physiotherapist, a doctor or a nurse, uh, because we can show you the correct technique and make sure that you have the correct uh, uh, technique. Uh, otherwise, you won't see any improvement no matter how many exercises you do. Um, the, um, uh, uh, generally, um, uh, these, these issues um, tend to get better the more you do the exercises. And as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, there's no good medicine for this condition. I wish there was, mm. um, but um, the thereafter, then we have to consider all those minimally invasive options and the surgery as well. So for minimally invasive surgery and um, this, in, in, in fact, for surgery itself, do we expect any side effect after? Or maybe the better question would be, will we be, be cured? Can we be fully cured? Uh, so the, the answer to that question, it really depends on which technique we are using. Um, if we are using the, the usual gold standard uh, surgical and treatment options, such as the tapes and the slings, then I can confidently tell you that the outcome is very, very good. And there's a lot of um, research, uh, scientific uh, papers uh, and, uh, that look into it that shows the outcome is very, very good. However, when it comes to all the other minimally invasive options, then it will depend on which minimally invasive option you are, we are talking about because sometimes the outcomes can be quite mixed and mm. everybody's condition is a little bit different. So if let's say you have mild incontinence, uh, as we mentioned earlier, maybe just one or two drops a day, for example, then yes, you might probably respond quite well to some of the minimally invasive options. Whereas mm. if someone on the other end of the spectrum uses a, a lot of pads and you know the the leakage is quite severe, then they may not really respond very well to some of the minimally invasive options that we mentioned. Yeah. Okay. So one, one more question that we have is, when is actually TVT necessary? Mm. Um, generally, we will do a TVT for the slightly older lady. So uh, not uh, the, the younger ladies, uh, usually someone in the perimenopausal age group. Um, and uh, the TVT is usually typically done if someone has tried pelvic floor exercises for uh, at least a one month to six weeks and that doesn't seem to work and the leakage is severe enough to affect their day-to-day -day function. So it affects, if it affects their work or if it affects their ability to uh, uh, exercise. So I have a lot of ladies who have come to tell me that uh, they, because of the uh, stress incontinence, they tend to hold back when they are uh, attending uh, classes in the gym. Uh, in fact, they try not to jump too much. They try to not drink water before the gym class starts. And uh, they definitely try and avoid doing anything to do with a trampoline because that is, that is a big no-no. trampoline does not, uh, unfortunately, uh, help that situation. 
Mm. So one more thing is, um, okay, assuming like my situation is confirmed, permanent, gone through many uh, checks, because this is actually a very common topic that Society for Continents actually have as well. So mm. they come back to us to say that we have already tried um, many different ways of uh, whether is it lifestyle changes from the cutting down of drinking to caffeine to bladder diary, but the, the entire uh, treatment does not work. So from a professional point of view, is there anything else or rather what else, uh, what other lifestyle changes we can do to just decrease the urine leakage at least? Mm, so um, some, I, I think human beings are very uh, adaptable and uh, they are very, um, they're very cute and clever when it comes to adapting to a difficult situation. I think ladies are particularly tough, so they, they tend to find cute little ways to deal with their situation. Um, so if a, a lady is um, um, trying to work her way around reducing the amount of leakage uh, before a certain activity, as I mentioned earlier, they tend to not drink so much before that the activity. They also tend to pee before uh, mm. the activity, so pee before the gym class, so that the bladder is mostly empty. And when they exercise, they don't leak so much. In other uh, so, words, it's also to recognize your body pattern to mm, yeah. it down. Uh. Okay. Yeah, so, so women are very resilient. <laughs> Indeed, we are. So the other question that I have, uh, in fact, more questions are coming up. Um, so what is the difference between TBT and TBTO? Mm, okay, uh, thanks for that question, Diana. Um, so it's just a matter of the, the direction in which we, we, the arms of the tape come out. So uh, TBT, the arms of the tape uh, come out through the tummy wall. Whereas for TBTO, the arms of the tape come out through the thigh. Um, then there's a, so that's the difference in technique. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, because of the different direction that the arms of the tape come out, the risk profile is slightly different. So uh, TBT is associated with slightly higher risk of bladder injury. TBTO is associated with slightly higher risk of thigh pain. But uh, if you compare the, the efficacy and the efficiency and the success rates of both techniques, they are about, they are about the same. Um, so it depends uh, about your discussion with the doctor uh, and which technique the doctor is most familiar with. That is probably the safest technique to choose uh, because then you have the lowest risk and the highest benefits. Okay, so we also have an endurance. Uh, oh, sorry. The, um, coming back to TBT, how long does last? Or... Uh, okay, it, it tends to last quite long for many, many years. Uh, in fact, I have patients who have the TBT there for... 10 to 20 years, uh, that's not an issue at all. Um, having said that, if you do have a lot of uh, um, uh, exercise that tends to put a lot of pressure on the TVT, um, then potentially, yes, you can get recurrence of the stress incontinence many years down the road, but uh, that does vary from person to person. Um, a lot of the times I find that the TVT is very long lasting, and very, very efficient. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chukwu. Another one is we have an endurance uh, runner amidst us. Um, mm. And after running 21.2 km, she actually finds that her urine is pink in colour. Mm. Is there anything wrong with um, the bladder? Ah, okay. That is called exercise hematuria. Uh, so hematuria is the medical term for blood in the urine. Um, and so that is quite common for uh, marathon runners. It happens to both men and women, uh, not just women. Uh, and that's because uh, your bladder has uh, been, um, uh, when you're running, the poor bladder is uh, badly shaken and moves up and down quite a lot. And uh, because the bladder is uh, mostly empty, you perspire a lot uh, in your run. Um, that jarring effect uh, causes the small blood vessels in the bladder to sort of like break. And therefore, uh, that's why a small amount of blood is released in the urine. Um, of course, we don't want to assume that it's always exercise hematuria. Any, any hematuria of blood in the urine should always uh, be taken as a, a situation that needs to be uh, investigated or checked out uh, because the other causes for blood in the urine must be excluded. Uh, and that includes things like urine, urinary tract infection, UTI, uh, stones, and also last but not least, uh, bladder cancers and uh, urinary tract cancers as well. Uh, but your typical situation that you have described is very suggestive of exercise hematuria. Thank you. And um, another question has to do with uh, cystoscopy. What are the risks that's being associated with the procedure for an elder person? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. Thanks for that. Uh, so cystoscopy is actually safe 90% of the time. Uh, 
Uh, and that's because it's a procedure that we, what we call a diagnostic procedure a lot of times. Uh, we introduce the scope um, uh, after we've uh, cleaned the area. And usually uh, we will put a gel with some local anesthetic so that the scope glides into the pee pipe and into the bladder itself. Uh, because it glides in, there's minimal risk of uh, injuring or uh, scratching the inside. Um, and uh, uh, there's minimal risk of uh, causing any bleeding. The only thing that we are, doctors are typically afraid of when doing a scope is infection. So generally, most of us will uh, at least do a urine test before we do a scope to make sure that we don't have any ongoing urine infection before we introduce the scope itself. Um, if we, after we put in the scope, if we do see uh, any abnormalities or cloudy urine, then uh, usually we will give uh, some antibiotics after the scope to make sure that you don't get infection after the scope. Uh, other than that, uh, scope is very, very safe. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we have covered most of the question. Um, and actually, there is one thing that I would also like to take this platform to share with everyone. Um, I think at the end of the day, one of the things that uh, Society for Continents really stand for is to bring back um, dignity, as well as for all of us to gain back our quality of life from continence care. So this is also one of the reasons why we are very thankful to have Tana to come on board as the other first leading brand. And following on this section, we want to thank Dr. Kuo for all her sharing. Uh, if you have any question, I'm very sure Dr. Kuo is more than willing to have her questions answered through her email that's on the screen. Or you can always feel free to contact us at Society for Continents and we will try to assist more. So over to Tana to let us know why is it important to have a good brand of diaper and not one of the silliest uh, thing that uh, uh, myth that we always have is to use diapers, uh, uh, sorry, to use um, sanitary pad or toilet paper, why it doesn't work. So we need um, Tana to come aboard to share with us um, about the product. So over to yourself, Jenny, and over to yourself, Gina. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, thank you, Dr. Kuo. Thank you, Alicia. Um, before I start, actually, I would like all the participants to take a poll um, Tina would like you to try on a poll to answer some of the questions. I'm launching the poll now and uh, please answer them. Okay, I'll launch it now. Can you please answer the poll based on your side? And then once the poll is behind us, we will, yes, we, it's coming in. We have uh, 14, 15% of the people already, you know, telling us their feedback. Now we are on 28%. Thank you, participants. Very glad that all of you are so participative. And especially this condition actually affects a lot of us, myself included. We are on 60% now. We are almost there. Those people who have not answered, can you please help? You're on 66%. We are one minute, 70%. A lot more coming in. We have a couple of participants who have not managed. Never mind, don't worry, we'll give you a little bit more time. I think. Continence is actually something that a lot of us are very, very concerned. For me, it all started with, you know, I guess myself, you know, started running and then perhaps with stress and now aging. So this is a condition that I also am very, very particular. And I'm so glad that, you know, um, Tina has got this discrete napkins that I've been using. I used to use Norman uh, Di, um, liners earlier, but I always find that there's a stench. So until I found, you know, um, Tina, I don't have to live with that embarrassment anymore. Okay. Um, now we are 81%. It's still coming in. We are two minutes into the poll. Maybe I'll just leave it to run for another um, half a minute. We have got uh, an 81%. Okay, it looks like the rest are not so familiar. I'll let it run. But anyway, uh, I'll just let it run. And perhaps, Gina, you can start your sharing now. 
Okay. Over to you, Gina. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, so first of all, we'd like to wish everyone happy International so Women's Day. So um, we all know that bladder weakness is not, um, it's not a topic that we all will talk about over a meal or with our friends during a gathering. So there is always a lot of um, misconception and um, misunderstanding about um, incontinence. So today, before I go on to the products that we, can, we have, I would like to talk about some of the facts, some of the myths and facts um, on the incontinence stereotype. So first of all, sorry, just give me a moment. Um, I will need to share my slides again. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, Okay, so the first myth that we always thought of is incontinence only affects the elderly. But this is actually not true. The fact is, um, there is what if in one in every three women um, over the age of 35 actually experience urine leak, including little leaks, some form of leaks, especially for women who have, who have gone through like pregnancy or childbearing uh, women. So um, we can't all... Well, so the second myth that we have will be incontinence that mostly affects women. But the fact actually is as many as one out of four men over the age of 40 have some form of leakage issues, especially men with like um, enlarged prostate um, or the benign prostate, uh, prostate hyperplasia. So the third myth that we um, always have is we do not know that there is no one that I know of has got um, this incontinence issue. Um, the reason why is just because that like what I mentioned earlier, we do not really talk about it or we are too shy to talk about it or we are very hesitant to even visit a doctor because we find that it's really embarrassing to talk about, to, talk, uh, to bring this topic about. So actually in the worldwide, um, an estimated of 400 million people are incontinent. So actually, it is unlikely that you know someone, uh, you, you do not know someone that um, has got this problem. You may be even that like, you just have to basically, you just have to turn over to someone who, who you are talking to. That person may even have got this problem. So um, a, a common misconception that we have is we always, um, like Dr. Kuo has mentioned earlier, sometimes we tend to, um, in order not to frequent the toilet too much, like probably before a gym session. It's true, yeah, we should not be drinking so much water as to avoid going to the toilet. But we must always bear in mind that um, it is always, we need to stay hydrated throughout the day. So it is important for us to be drinking at least six to eight glasses of water per day to keep our bladder functioning properly. So the, the trick is actually um, to take sips of water throughout the day rather than gulping down like um, two to three glasses at one time, um, so as not to stress our bladder too much. So it's actually very important that we need to uh, keep hydrated throughout the day, so as to keep our bladder functioning. So some of the tips that I would like to share with you all on how to live with bladder weakness over. One of it will be, of course, to check the amount of fluid you drink. Like what I mentioned, we need to stay hydrated throughout the day. So we need to include Kegel exercises in our routine. If Kegel exercises do not take a, a lot of time, a lot of our time every day. We just need to take like about two, three minutes a day just to do a bit of um, the exercise to strengthen our pelvic muscles. So of course, um, I, I guess this has been um, mentioned throughout this talk as into we need to limit the consumption of caffeine and alcohol, which will trigger um, the bladder and uh, causes an overactive bladder, especially as, like because caffeine and alcohol, they're actually diuretics. So I'm going to just um, go on. Um, okay, so it is also known that um, incontinence um, equals to, it, it's actually a myth, incontinence equals to bad hygiene. The fact is actually we need to use proper purpose-made products which ensure dryness and discretion by locking the, in the urine and odor away from the body which provides um, 
is able to provide freshness, comfort, and good hygiene. So I'm going to just show you a video first. Blue liquid. We won't be using that. Oh, lovely flowers. Go in, go in, gone. And it absorbs instantly. So the video actually is to reinforce to us that it is important because uh, most of us will always convenient, especially for the ladies, we will conveniently just take out, pull out our sanitary pad um, whenever we expand, uh, experience some ma minor leaks. But um, what I want to tell you today over here it is sanitary pad is actually very different from purpose-made products for bladder weakness, which is the liners and pads. So from this chart, we can see that the differences between um, the liners and pads for bladder weakness and our sanitary pad. So for um, incontinence pads, it's actually designed to, for rapid, um, to absorb rapid flow of urine. So that's why it is more absorbent as compared to a sanitary pad, which is designed to absorb blood, which is thicker. So it also has got ingredients that neutralizes the odor specifically to the urine as well. And um, it also, because of the dryness, it prevents skin infections. So over in um, Tina, there are many products in, in the market. And especially for China itself, we have a full range of um, incontinence pads, especially for ladies. Um, it, it ranges from our ultra mini that is meant for like the minor leaks, just probably just a few drops of leaks at one time, uh, all the way to our Lady Super, which is able to absorb up to one complete void that is about 400 to uh, 400 over meals of urine each time. So there are a full range of products for us to choose from. So I'm going to show you another video again. actually gives a very good um, illustrations of how um, the product itself works. It is definitely discreet and secure and because of um, our microprotect technology, it is able, the pad is actually 20% thinner as um, just as secure and double securing the core itself. So it is eight times drier than your normal sanitary pad and um, the pad actually moves to your body due to its asymmetrical shape core improving the comfort fit and security. So if let's, um, this, the, all these pads are available on all the major supermarkets and online stores. So however, if you are still not sure of which product um, to be using, you can always go on to our website to request for a sample or even call our hotline to request for a sample. We can mail it out to you and you can try it first before we, um, making um, a purchase um, from all the major outlets. Okay, so with this, I will pass on my time back to Felicia, who uh, will do the close up for us. Felicia, to back to you. Um, I think before we close, actually, yeah. um, there are a couple of questions. Um, one of the attendees asks, "Is your product expensive?" Actually, um, people always have got a misconception that uh, is co uh, coin continence pad is actually more expensive than the sanitary pad. Actually, it's comparable to a sanitary pad. The cost itself can range um, depend and um, the size and the, the function of it, it ranges from between um, like uh, 20 cents per piece all the way to 60 cents a piece. Mm -hmm. Okay, and next question, a very interesting one. Can I wear the pet for the whole day if I don't leak? It is actually not recommended to uh, put on the pet, although even though if you don't leak, it, 
it is dry, we always um, encourage, um, it's a recommendation to actually change your pad. It's the same as when you change for your sanitary pad as well, to change it uh, every between every four to six hours a day. That is um, more of like a personal hygiene purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and last but not least, but I'm quite sure you've just answered that question, where to buy your product? <laughs> okay, so um, the products are uh, available at all the major um, supermarkets, um, outlets, and even online stores as well. So, um, yep, you can get it, in fact, anywhere. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Now over to Felicia. Felicia, you have the floor now. <laughs> thank you so much, ladies, and thank you for all of you who are staying on with us. I think a very important platform for all of us is it will be wonderful if all of you can go into the Facebook and you could like Society for Continents SG. Um, this is because we have a lot of upcoming events for nurses, for caregivers, even for patients. And then you could follow Tina uh, Singapore. Uh, please right now, just go into our Facebook and like all this so that you are always at the start and at the most prime of knowing what is the new technology, what is the new product, what is the most updated things. So of course, with Dr. Trisha Kuo, you have your Euro Health Medical Clinic. Um, and last but not least would be Prime, who has been organizing this wonderful thing behind the scene. Prime Magazine, they are a Prime Mag. SG, they are actually um, a healthcare uh, platform for us to know not just one side of health, but the holistic health of all of us. So the purpose of this is to really let, to empower the women of who we are today and that within continents, we will just make ourselves continents while managing it. And we wish you all a really happy um, International Women's Day. And thank you to all my panelists here for all the hard work. And thank you, Dr. Kuo, for sharing with us once again. And we really hope all of you will like it more. And the more likes we have, the more share we have, we also understand that you want to know more about incontinence and products. And even with Jenny, you are, sorry, with Prime, you will be able to tell us what are the topics that y'all might like us to, to follow from. So yes, thank you very much. And uh, we will close for tonight. Uh, we, we will wait for all of you to leave before we close the session. So good night, everyone. Goodbye. Good night and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for all the all the thank yous. Thank you. Most welcome, Okay. Thank you. Good night.